I'm David Knowles, and this is a special edition of Ukraine, the latest. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Today, we mark the upcoming bloody anniversary of an unprovoked and illegal war that has dominated headlines for the past year. From February 2022, Russian forces unleashed a campaign of war crimes, torture, deportation and violence upon the entire territory of Ukraine in an assault that had its origins years before, starting with the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and occupation of areas of Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts in the east of Ukraine. After an attack which stalled and finally ground to a halt by the end of the summer, the Ukrainian armed forces pushed their adversaries back in the north and across the river Dnipro in the south. Now, Western nations promise more and more material, while the Russian army struggles in the Donbass and continues to bombard civilians. Both sides are racing against time, with Russia desperate to achieve its strategic goals before Ukraine counterattacks with a host of donated weapons from its allies around the world. With me to discuss the impact of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Europe and the world, it's a pleasure to welcome Associate Editor of The Telegraph for Defence, Dominic Nichols, Francis Sternley, our Assistant Comment Editor, former Ukrainian MP Alyona Halovko, and novelist and poet Oksana Zabuzko. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us today. Dom, can I start with you? I'd like each of you to give a, a summary of your thoughts on the past year. You've been looking at the military uh, impacts of this, of the full-scale invasion. What stood out to you in 2022 and 2023? Yeah, well, thanks, David. I think it was amazing how poorly Russia planned this war. Now, we know that Russia wanted to have a lightning advance and to take Kyiv within days and then the rest of the country would fall. Um, that's the strategy. That strategy didn't work and has been shown not to work. But, but, but regardless of that, the way they did it was completely against what you would expect a professional military force to do. Russia attacked with basically five armies. There were three land armies, one in the north, one in the south, one in the east. Then the Air Force was doing its own thing, and the Navy in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov were also sort of cutting about, doing its own stuff, launching missiles, and none of it was talking to each other, none of it was coordinated, none of it was prioritised, none of it was working to any sort of set plan. They were just all doing their own thing in the hope that they'd all race to Kiev or race to the Dnipro River or do whatever they were going to do, and it was all going to be fine. There was no overall commander. Russia did not put one person in charge to orchestrate the whole thing. And we saw it run into the sand. We saw the, the stout resistance that, that grew very, very quickly, that held, held these forces back after some land grab. And then the weeks that followed after, uh, after the initial um, invasion on February the 24th, they were eventually pushed back. Russian, Russian forces were pushed out of the north of the country and the east of the country. The Air Force were realized that it hadn't knocked out the Ukrainian Air Force and therefore didn't have command of the skies to allow it to do whatever it wanted to do. And what it wants to do is give the freedom of action to the ground forces underneath it. So that didn't work. And the Navy sort of threatened an amphibious assault around Odessa and, and various bits and pieces down on the south coast, which did have some military effect because Ukraine had to counter that or hold forces in the area just in case but really didn't do much more than that and the whole thing just wasn't wasn't working together as, as a well-oiled machine it was it was five disparate parts it was only later when Russia was ejected from the north of the country that they actually came up with this idea of having one single commander and even then they never really managed to get anything going because by then they were too bogged down they'd lost so much equipment Ukraine had managed to withstand the initial assault and had got reserves in of them from themselves, mobilized people and equipment, and also started to get support in from, from outside the country, particularly the long range artillery, which really did, had a great effect in holding Russia back to, into the east of the Donbass. And so by the time Russia realized what kind of fight it was in, it couldn't do anything about it. And it's now sort of fixed in, in, a, in a largely static, very attritional battle uh, in the east of the country and to a certain extent the south but especially in the Donbass and Russia has reverted to to type reverted to the old way of of doing war which is to fire a load of artillery and then sort of rush in afterwards and try and try and claim the ground that's left 
and they haven't got a huge amount of artillery left. They certainly haven't got many people of any of any note left because they're experienced troops and commanders are either killed or wounded or back in Russia training the next mobilized group. But there just aren't the people there anymore who are who are the core of a professional army in order to break through the, the largely frozen conflict that we've seen for the last few months. Thank you very much, Don. We'll come back to several things you mentioned there, I think. Um, Francis Sternley, you've been looking at this, at the full-scale invasion, often through the lens of international politics. What are your thoughts on the past year? Well, first of all, I would echo what Don was saying there about the attritional war on the military front. That is, of course, hugely significant. And the anxiety for Ukraine, I think, is that if one looks at the broad brush of the annals of military history, then those countries that have access to enormous resources that can be brought to bear on the battlefield over a sustained period of time tend to be successful. One can look at, of course, in the American Civil War, the side of the Union. One can look in the Second World War with the Soviets when they'd fully, once they'd fully mobilized. And what's important, I think, about those two examples is that both were instances of where the aggressor, the Germans or the uh, Confederacy, in terms of the attacks that they were launching, were broadly successful at the beginning of the war. And one could say the same for the Ukrainians. But it was the ultimately the mass resources that were mobilized that, that won the day. Now, there's no reason to think why, that that can't happen with the West mobilizing its resources for Ukraine's benefit in the long run. And that is the great challenge now, I think, in the military sphere, is it's a race for resources from, uh, for Ukraine from the West. And will it bring all of its factories, all its might, all its weaponry to bear for Ukraine? Versus whether Russia ha can, can fully do the same and we'll have to see on the battlefront. But you talk about the, the political challenges now. Yes, I think we're also facing a war of attrition there as well, because in this coming year, we're going to have to see who's going to blink first and what their definition of victory looks like, I think. As I said in, in I think, one of the first episodes of the year, the definitions of victory as articulated by Ukraine and by Russia are currently incompatible. Something has to shift. And I think that shift is most likely to happen on the battlefield. But the other challenge is going to be whether it's going to perhaps be what changes in the political sphere. The changes in the political sphere could be from the Ukrainian side. It could be that the West begins to, to blinks, as it were. Maybe the nuclear question will come in again. That's an anxiety. Or it could blink from the Russian perspective if the economic impact of this war begins to come to bear, if Ukraine were able to score some substantial military victories in these counterattacks. And so there's a lot of factors that, that, that come into play here. But broadly speaking, I think that we have to, as the West, be thinking now about how to make the economic sanctions be really be felt in Russia, because I think that's going to be the thing that will make a shift in, in, in how they begin to approach the war. Because until it really begins to bite back home, I don't think we're going to be a, see a fundamental shift and Russia blink first. Thank you, Francis. Well, you mentioned international politics there. Can we look at Ukrainian politics? Aliona, you're a former Ukrainian MP. How have you seen uh, Ukraine's politics change and shift over the past year? I think first and foremost, I'm thinking back to this day nine years ago. And social media keeps reminding me of the posts I was making exactly nine years ago on this day uh, when we were all um, on Maidan, uh, the independence square in Kiev. Um, when it was really the middle of the revolution of dignity in Kyiv and we were witnessing our first casualties. Uh, later, uh, one year later in 2015, this day uh, was established as the National Commemoration Day for the victims of Fallen 100, that's what they were called, because it was 104 casualties amongst the civilians who gave their lives to fight against special forces and police um, who tried to uh, make the people stop the protests. And that was essentially the beginning of this of this fight. As soon as we got rid of then pro-Russian President Yanukovych and he fled to Russia, several days later, Russia announced, technically announced war on Ukraine. It annexed Crimea and then started uh, military actions in the east. Looking back to this day nine years ago of how Ukraine really struggled to ascertain its own demand for freedom and fighting for that freedom and giving everything we had and facing bullets with wooden shields in the streets of Kyiv, the European capital, um, and pleading for help from the West and asking for the US and for Western nations like the UK and France and Germany who are now heavily invested in Ukrainian politics to speak out, to come and to help us and 
just to recognize that this is the war that Russia is waging on Ukraine, uh, that it's nothing else that the Russian narratives were then propagating in the media. And seeing where we are now, uh, with me sitting in the studio of Telegraph, the, the number one global media in the world, with President Biden being in Kyiv, greeting President Zelensky, acting as if they are the two global leaders of the free world today, after all of his visits to Western capitals recently. Um, I think the narrative has changed immensely and Ukraine has become um, number one country in the world right now in terms of exposure and in terms of importance. Because whatever happens in Ukraine, whatever outcome is achieved in Ukraine in this coming year, in 2023, uh, the whole world will depend on it. Thank you very much, Aliona. Oksana, thank you so much for joining us today. You've been a writer and a poet and looking at Ukrainian society and culture for, for many years now. Looking back over the past year, what stood out to you? Thursday 24, very early in the morning, I was awakened with a phone call from home. And it was, honey, it's started. They are bombing us. And this honey, it started, this has been the phrase which millions of Ukrainians were at this hour exchanging with their loved ones. Aliona, um, Oksana mentioned the, the honey it's begun moment that she says every single Ukrainian had. Um, I think lots of the Ukrainians we've spoken to over the past year talk of that moment. Did, did you have that as well? What, Absolutely. What was the start of the, the invasion like for you? I remember that the night before, obviously, it's been quite intense two weeks leading up to the day of uh, full-scale invasion because London was obviously buzzing with discussions and, and meetings and roundtables. Is it going to happen or not? Um, so I've been quite engaged in those. And the night before, because it, there was such a long lead up, you, we expected the invasion on Tuesday that week and then Wednesday. And then so every day you would kind of brace yourself to face the terrible news. And um, I remember when the invasion didn't happen at the second alert on, on Wednesday, I uh, thought on Thursday, okay, maybe we can exhale now and who knows, maybe it's not going to happen. The intelligence was still very contradictory those days. Um, and on Thursday, I remember really struggling to go to sleep. I think I only managed to fall asleep at 4 a.m. And little did I know that London time, 4 a.m., that's exactly when, when Russia started bombing Ukraine. And two hours later, um, I woke up from a phone call from my grandmother, uh, who was then in the country and obviously probably watching the news and being woken up by uh, missiles blowing up all around. Uh, we are based in the west of the country, so it wasn't directly in the city, but it was nearby. And her words were, child, wake up, the war has started. And I think those words made me so shocked that I started getting loads of uh, phone calls from journalists in London who kind of pre-booked me a, a week before saying that is it okay for us to call you in the middle of the night anytime if the invasion happens to get the first comment and I remember missing all of the phone calls and not being able to speak or to pick up the phone because I was just crying and trying to comprehend whether my country is going to exist by that evening and what's going to happen to my family and my brother. That was a quite a horrible day and I remember the first day was so long uh, when you kind of see the updates every minute and you call everyone you know and everyone you love and just check if everyone's alive. And I think that has been, that's continued for about a week of very little sleep and constantly in the news and on the phone and at the events. Um, definitely a, a very different reality now, thank goodness, because we've lost it. Dom, you, you're in your opening spiel, you talked about the failure of the Russians and you touched a little bit on the success of the Ukrainians. C could you go into a bit more detail? Why have the Ukrainians been so successful? And maybe, maybe start that story um, in the training in the years before. Yeah, so I think, I think what Ukraine w were able to do was have enough, enough ready on February the 24th to withstand the initial shock. So Michael Howard, great historian, British British military historian, said that, that for a military force, you can't you can't build it and, and be right. It will cost too much to be right for every possible outcome that, that you might be faced with. You'll bankrupt the country trying to be trying to be right. What you have to do is be is be good enough so that when the threat reveals itself, you can quickly adjust what you've got and and face that threat. And I think that's what Ukraine managed to do was they they obviously had, had great intelligence such that they were able to, s to disperse a lot of the air force and the Russians were able to hit or then hit 
empty airfields or dummy airfields and did not knock the Ukrainian Air Force out of the war in the first few hours. Um, but also they had, they had enough ready to, to, with, to blunt that initial attack for the first few days, particularly the uh, attempted air assault onto Hostomol airfield, which is just outside Kyiv to the north. Russia tried to land there, from which they were then going to expand into the city rapidly. This was in the first, first few hours of the war. So they were managed to, Ukraine managed to push those forces away. And then they, they, they were able to take a breath. After a few days, they were able to see what was happening and, and, and restock and, and better adjust in this the description I just gave of Michael Howard's. So they were able to hold on for the first couple of weeks and blunt that initial assault. And then after that, I think they showed su such innovation and courage because they, they, they took a pause and watched what was happening to them, what, what the... Russians were trying to do. And what the Russians were trying to do was just drive tanks towards Kiev, essentially, from the north um, and from the north northeast, from Chernihiv and Sumy and that area, and into Kharkiv as well, and, and from the south, but mainly to try and get to the capital and, and cut off the, 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 the leadership of the country, and then, the, and then they felt the rest of the country would fall. But they were very tank-heavy, and tanks just driving down a road are extremely vulnerable. This is not how you do tank warfare. It's not how you do armored warfare. And what Ukraine was able to do was to see this and have the confidence to sort of stop and think about how to, how to counter that. And they very rapidly developed a force of um, small teams, five or six individuals, if that, um, armed with anti-tank missiles to, to uh, go and attack these vehicles. But beyond that, what they did was they allowed the initial tanks to come past them and they attacked the logistic train behind because a, a, tank, a tank is great it's full of full of guns and bullets and fuel and all the rest of it but it will it will run out after about 100 k's ish and that's not even fighting that's just just driving it's going they're going to break down they need resources they need to be s supported so if they don't have that logistic resupply which is which is just behind them a few kilometers behind them if you like if they're not there because they've been destroyed by these Ukrainian anti-tank teams then those tanks can't do anything now of course they can still use their guns and use the barrel and what but they're not, they're not going to move if they've run out of fuel so in the first few weeks Ukraine were were really good at having the confidence to allow these forces to come at them avoid the initial assault and go behind them to knock out the logistics and then just destroy the tanks at their leisure largely at their leisure now that takes huge confidence um, to turn around to your senior political leadership as, as General Zeluzhny, the head of the U Ukraine's armed forces, you know, I don't know, but I can imagine a conversation with him turning around to President Zelensky and saying, right, well, what's the big plan then, General? Our big plan is to do nothing and allow the tanks to come towards us and we'll have a go at the fuel trucks behind. I mean, an amazing plan an amazing confidence from the political leadership to trust the military advice and say, OK, if you think that's that's what, what is going to work, if that's your advice, then go for it. So I think very early on, we saw great innovation and courage from from the Ukrainian armed forces. We saw a great um, strategic insight from the military leadership about how to blunt this force that was coming at them and great confidence from the pol po from the political leadership to say, OK, off you go, I mean, because you know, President Zelensky's job is to look up and out and to build that external coalition and to work on the internal politics. He should leave the the fighting over to his chief of chief of the um, general staff. Of course, they always work in tandem. But it it shows great confidence to say, "Off you go, then go go and go and do that." I'll give you the political space to go and to go and do that uh, to work that plan. And that then lasted for the next few, well, the, for the early few months until Russia decided that they just weren't, they just couldn't do this. They could, just driving down long lines of vehicles just wasn't going to work. And that's why they eventually turned around and, and left the north and the northeast of the country. So I just think it was that those first few weeks when the anti-tank missiles and the teams running around um, at night and, and, and by day, but having the confidence to allow the, 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 the heavy armor to come past them and then to launch their attacks. I showed, I think that, that confidence and courage set the trend for what we've seen over the next few months. Well, you mentioned President Zelensky, and we'll come back to him, I think, because the last year has revealed what's at stake for Ukraine and for the world and for Europe. Francis, would you like to sort of go on, talk about that a little bit? What what's it, do you think it's revealed to, to, to Western Europe and to, to Britain? Well, I think it's, it's opened up 
the West's eyes to the reality of the world in which we exist in now. I mean, I, I remember growing up in the sort of shadow of Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History, and this idea that history, <laughs> the history, thank you for that. Thank <laughs> you for this remark. Well, the hi history, yes. history had ended, and yes. and that uh, liberalisation was inevitable, and that history had been paused permanently. And it was really a great spirit of optimism and technological innovation. Although actually, I think the book is unfairly summarised in many ways because he's actually talking about it as being quite a pessimistic thing. But anyway, that's a, a let's digression. Leave that, let's leave that for, that, let's yeah. leave that for another side. <laughs> but um, this this is was an era, I think, when you talk looking at the post-Soviet collapse until the war in Ukraine of, of huge political naivety. The West enabled Putin and to some extent is still enabling China to do what it wants and thinks that the way in which to uh, exert its values is by soft power, is by uh, operating with um, maintaining financial ties, maintaining diplomatic ties. But I think the huge lesson of Ukraine is, is that what that did with, at least in the case of Russia, it, ha is it enabled Putin. It, and it gave him the financial strength, the political strength, in order to uh, make incremental steps that eventually led us to the war in Ukraine. And I think if we think about this in terms of what mistakes led us here, then I think that would be a huge one, was the uh, historical and cultural naivety. So there's the long-term factors that got us here. But I think also we should think in terms of the short-term factors as well. And I think that those um, commentators who are seen as being almost warmongers and hawkish about the idea of actually having some uh, troops on the ground in Ukraine at the invitation of President Zelensky, maybe NATO forces, UN peacekeepers or something like that, that may well have been enough if those had been stationed in there in, in, in 2020 or uh, very early 2021 to deter Putin. But effectively, they believe the Russian narrative that that would be seen as too aggressive. And as a consequence of that, Putin took advantage. He saw the direction of travel that Ukraine was heading more towards a Western future and decided that if he was going to strike, he had to strike now. So in terms of the significance of this war, I think it is a huge wake up call for the West, but it should be an even broader wake up call from, from the European perspective, but from a global perspective, because frankly, I think the mistakes that enabled R Putin and Russia are being m made with regard to China as well. Oksana, you, 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 oh, you. I have a lot. <laughs> I have a lot to contribute. Is, is that, is that, that the kind of thing you like to hear from Western thinkers? That's my favorite subject. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, of course, I, of course, I wish you know I would have been able to go on working on my novel, <laughs> to which I was so rudely interrupted a year ago. Well, but um, about this, uh, you know, what's been missed and where to start, you know, looking back, where was the turning point? Okay, I would have said uh, the turning point was uh, the attack on Georgia in 2008. That's been, uh, you know, um, the end, uh, that's been the most ostentatious and brutal violation of the international law as it's been established in Europe after World War II. So if these sanctions that Russia got uh, after February 24 last year um, were um, issued uh, 14 years ago uh, in August 2008. Well, then maybe we would have been living in a little bit different world nowadays. Uh, lots of crimes, uh, you know, um, perpetuated by the Russian government, even before Putin, even in the 90s, were just, um, well, I don't know, not taken much of a hit, so to speak. Uh, like, uh, the first Chechen war was missed completely. Uh, and it's been a kind of a trying playground for the later strategies of the um, of this state terrorist warfare that Russia then was practicing in Syria and now in Ukraine, you know, on full scale, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, so basically, it is all about. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it might sound very literate, but it is all the story of pride and prejudice on the side of the West. Pride in belief that it's us who has won the Cold War, and now we are going to teach 
them you know how to build democracy we will help them you know to survive and uh, and okay the end of history and you know consumerism remains the only burning problem of humanity and enter Fukuyama and enter and enter even verse Yuval Harari who says that people are, are not going to die from the wars uh, in the 21st century any longer you know but more of suicide than of the, than of the wars or something like this. Stephen, Stephen Pinker has argued similar. Uh, I think. My goodness, I mean, I mean, it's, it is you know such a such a lovely kind of mm, uh, juvenile uh, self confidence. Uh, like yeah, you know we've shown we've won. Uh, well, while in fact Russia never stopped going on with its uh, Cold War techniques since 1991. It's been all in action and the continuity of the same state institutions uh, uh, starting with uh, what GPU, NKVD, KGB, uh, FSB. Now, well, that's the real ruling inner party speaking in terms of Orwell's 1984. And uh, all this has been kind of ignored because Oh, you know, they have they have such a poor economy, you know, they are so poor, so how can they compete with us? We are so smart and we are rich and we know we know how to live well. They don't want to live well. They want to dominate you. That's the big difference. That's the psychology of the mm, prison world, the political architecture of the prison world. And while I've been listening to Donald, I've been thinking that um, you know what you are, what you are, uh, um, what you are picturing. Uh, well, so expertly uh, f for me, it is. I mean, in my writer's perception looks like uh, the war, like the juxtaposition of the army of free people on our side, people with motivation and free initiative, people who know why they are here and what they want to do, and the army of slaves who go to the foreign country at best for looting because they don't they have no other social lifts in their own country and just because they have no social responsibility for their own life so it is just you know this as they call it vertical of power this political architecture of prison world and this is you know th really the clash of civilization well not in uh, not in this outdated terms um, huntingdon yeah yeah yeah. yeah, but I mean, if I may jump in there, I mean, that what you've described there neatly encapsulates, I think, one of the reasons why this war has not gone the way Russia wanted, and how and why U Ukraine has been so successful is because Russia has got this top-down approach. There is no decision making at a low level; they just yeah. do what they're told from above, yeah. and so they are very inflexible. Even if the people on the ground at the front can see that the plan is not working they are not empowered to to change it whereas ukraine and i think and, and you know, you'll be great here i think the lessons from maidan was was that anybody anybody can have an idea and if it's good we'll listen to it which is quite alien to us in, in many ways in this country in the west but no anybody can have an idea and if it's good we'll, we'll take it on it doesn't matter what what position in the military or in society you are but ukraine were have been able to really take that those those ideas from from wherever the, if they're a good idea we'll we'll do that and and it's very bottom up led or or, or decision making can ideas can come from anywhere in the chain and it's not it's not written off just because you may be younger or you're not in uniform or you're in uniform but you're quite junior or you're in uniform but you're quite <laughs> you're a woman what have you which you know we have big big hang-ups in in the west about a lot of these things we still we're still very deferential in many ways to um to to, to the more senior you are uh, or the older you are you must know loads so we'll we'll listen to you so we're not we're not a million miles um uh, you know away from that here but i think that that those two philosophies 
yeah. have, yeah. have yeah. met I, in I Eastern Europe. I fully agree. It's, it's a proof that even in the army, which is very authoritative structure, uh, mm. democracy is more proves to be more efficient. Yeah, I mean, you could argue not authoritarian. Yeah, yeah, <coughs> you, Ukraine is in many ways encapsulating the democracy it's fighting for in how it's fighting yeah. and the method in which it is approaching this war. Yeah, Can I mean, I, I, I was I was told once when I came up with. A with an idea and a military operation, Dom, we're here to uphold democracy, not practice it, <laughs> which I thought was, <laughs> home, was a, little, a little bit unsure, but anyway. And maybe that's that's been the, the big difference of this uh, really groundbreaking war. And when all the odds were against us, we've managed to prevail. And going back to what you said about Maidan, anyone can have an idea, anyone can voice it, and anyone can go ahead and execute it. Because there was one instance on, on Maidan, first of all, it was very bottom up effort. Uh, the people just decided to rise up from, from the grounds in every single city of Ukraine, in Kiev. It was very self-organized protest. People were announcing that they were going up to the main square in their towns and cities and sometimes even villages uh, via Facebook, uh, which was the most famous social media platform in Ukraine back then, some Twitter efforts as well. Um, and that kind of created the social cohesion where everyone felt like every single person who comes over, who comes out on a very cold, freezing um, winter evening onto their square can make a difference. Every single voice counts. So it wasn't up for political elites who later, of course, led the effort. And even me being uh, one of the political party representatives, um, I was coordinating the effort in my home town Chernivtsi in the west and of course taking people to Kiev coordinating that they get there well and safe uh, where they're stationed which uh, little camp town that they're staying in because we were living in tents in central Kiev for several months and the photos that I've been looking through are just horrendous to be honest I don't know how we've survived and how we withstood those temperatures as well as everything else that came but even when it ca came to making a change in the revolution when we got completely desperate that A, the world is now going to help us. I mean, again, looking back to back then, and now we have President Biden in Ukraine. Back then, we barely got Victoria Nuland to attend and to give out little pastries to protesters to say that this is our sign of support. And we were thinking to ourselves, well, this is clearly we're not getting anywhere. The world is not going to support us in this. Um, Yes, and she was special representative, special envoy to to Ukraine, I think. So she always held that role, and she uh, knew the Ukrainian authorities quite closely. She then went to Moscow and spoke to them. And we were, you know, there was this narrative, especially embedded by the Russian propaganda, that the whole revolution was kind of created by CIA or FBI or whoever. We wished that someone from CIA and FBI helped us because it was purely effort, not even of political elites and leaders back then, it was all the people. And when eventually the leaders, under the pressure from foreign ambassadors, from the US representative Newland, when they came to uh, the three leaders of political parties back then, one of which was the, the leader of our party, Alexander Turchina, who eventually became an acting president right after President Yanukovych fled. They said directly, you need to negotiate, you need to settle this, let this president stay, you know, he will comply with some of your demands. He will maybe eventually sign an association agreement, but that's TBC because Russia really doesn't want those agreements to be signed. And, you know, take a step back. And when those political leaders came down to us on Maidan in Kiev, I remember that conversation very well. And they were saying, we have to announce this to the crowd. And you have to understand that the crowd it, at that time, it, it, you know, the, the number of people would vary, but at that time we had up to 100,000 of people on the square in winter determined to change the politics of the country. And they're thinking of how are we going to make this announcement? And I remember that one of the leaders, Arsenyi Yatsenyuk, made that announcement. Uh, it wasn't met very well. Um, and then just one of the random guys from... Um, you know, the audience, as you say, one of the protesters had an idea. He comes up onto the stage, he grabs a mic and he says, President Yanukovych, if you're not going to comply with everything we demand, if you're not signing EU association agreement, and if you don't leave the country with all of your proxies ASAP, we're going to be there in your office by this time. I, I don't remember which time frame he gave him, but let's say by next morning, and we're going to carry you out of there. One day later, the situation in the country changed dr dramatically. The president fled. Uh, 
the whole country was taken over by the opposition and we started making that change. So exactly that, because all of those people who fought on Maidan, who fought special forces with, you know, Molotov cocktails and whatever they could find on hand, they all moved to the east when the war had started, when, when we kept seeing those unidentified green men, as they were called back in the day, essentially, uh, Russian soldiers on our territory, they all moved from Maidan straight to the east to Donbass to fight. So that sense has stayed there. It has been preserved. And I think what's brilliant as well by the political leadership now and back then for, for the nine years of this war is that they've managed to not take that freedom away and that conviction away from people, but also to navigate it and still to lead it accordingly, you know, with the Western intelligence and support and everything we've been getting. So that has built a also a very trustful relationship between the people and the leadership. No discussion of Ukrainian um, political leadership in 2022, 2023 can exclude President Zelensky. So I'd be quite interested to hear um, really from everybody, your impressions of his leadership in the past year, especially the comparison potentially between Westerners who might be encountering Zelensky for the first time, might have known him only as, you know, oh, he was that, he was that comedian, he was that actor, wasn't he? Now he's the president with his leadership in this, uh, in this war. But also the Ukrainian perspective of a man many people didn't vote for. Um, and how, how have you seen his performance in the last year? So I don't know, maybe Donald Francis, if you talk us through the, the Western reaction first. Well, of course, his leadership has been extraordinary. And one of the great uh, questions of history continues to be is about the role or lack of role of individuals in shaping history. There are different schools of thought as to those who think that actually an individual merely encaptures the spirit of a time, very sort of Tolstoyan view, um, or actually the, the sort of more great men of history, Carlylean view, that uh, individuals shape history and we are merely instruments. I mean, of course, it's an oversimplified debate because actually there is, it, it's somewhere in between. But I think that Zelensky has really drawn attention to the fact that the critical decisions that a leader makes in the early hours of, of, of a war or another major political event can completely define the trajectory of, uh, of the conflict. I mean, I think if President Zelensky had chosen to leave Kyiv, I think that that would have had huge ramifications for how the West saw the war in Ukraine, what was at stake. It may or may not have had an impact on how Ukraine fought itself. I think that will be an open question that historians will debate. But nonetheless, he has been an absolute figurehead that has been able to articulate the significance of this war to a Western audience and in a very targeted and ingenious manner, which is absolutely uh, vital. Although I would say to that that he has, of course, been this moral beacon. But his stance as the war has gone on has become, because it has mobilised more forces to his cause amongst the West, he has gone further than when he began. When he, the war started, he talked about their being willing to have conversations with Russia in order to try and end the war and to, br to end the bloodshed. Now he, he sees that the way in which to mobilize the West to say no, you know, no quarter, this is an absolute, all right, we have to have absolute victory. Otherwise, you know, what was it for? What was it for? What's at stake? The West itself is at stake here. And I do wonder whether, and we'll obviously come later on to perhaps the direction of travel for this war, where it will go and, and, and peace and everything else, is to whether his room, by defining success and defining finding victory in those absolute terms, whether his position will become increasingly challenging, uh, challenged as the war goes on. Because one can foresee a situation where if, say, he and uh, his generals decide to seek to take Crimea and have some military success in that, that Putin ramps up the nuclear rhetoric that spooks the West. And then the West says, look, we'll support you in everything except seizing Crimea, which is a red line for Putin. And then Zelensky is in this decision as to whether he then says, well, actually, OK, we won't try and take Crimea, but we're willing to we w as long as we can keep the rest of the country. But the problem is, is, is his position then vulnerable? within Ukraine? Is he in a position where he has defined himself so strongly on a certain view that he himself would be politically imperiled? So I think that Zelensky has been a genius in this war in how he has operated so far, but he could potentially, if we were asking this in a year or two time, have boxed himself into such a position that actually it makes his own political future contestable. Well, thank you, Francis. Um, Aliona and Oksana, what do, you, what do you say to that? I'd be particularly interested in, in your appraisal of Zelensky as, as your president, some, somebody you may, you may or may not have voted for. Um, what, what do you make of what Francis said and what do you, how do you rate his performance in the past year? Zelensky, not Francis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I did not vote for him. And uh, I've been 
more than cautious towards this new type of politicians which are characteristic for the time of media populism when politics and show business uh, you know have clued together and become well inseparable i would say zelensky is makes a perfect he hero for this pe for exactly this epoch and i hate to sound like a ludit you know, fighting uh, the upcoming railway road, uh, well, but uh, that's more or less how I feel about that and kind of trying to evaluate, you know, his performance in the past year and I uh, deliberately use the word performance because he is a performing type, of course, and he does have a very good feeling of the audience as a communicator you know he knows how to he, he knew how to grab a moment how to sense when the role of his life was coming up and that's it and that was this maidan strategy or maidan technique which alona has just described uh, a moment ago when everyone in the community and the community is a 40 million country, is doing what he or she knows to do the best, and that proves to be exactly what is needed at the moment. So he was an actor, and he started to act as a president of the country in need should immediately and that was absolutely turning point you know with this phrase i don't need a lift i need an ammunition okay you really sound like an apollon hey you know that's one of those coined phrases that goes into the textbooks and yes it is important it's extremely important because you know uh, okay we can we can use the closest sample closest parallel in time world war two and hitler's attack on poland uh, well september 1939 the polish government fled away to romania and uh, this this moment, uh, well, you, you guys might be a little bit insular here on this island of yours, but in our part of Europe, on this bloodlands, you know, according to Timothy Snyder's term, everyone was then in tension because that was the trigger. You know, will the history repeat itself? And when it did not, and when you know this funny actor this former clown again you know it's a perfect role you know a clown who becomes a hero and it's it's great for a popular mythology mm, so and and he appears with this i don't need a lift i need an ammunition goodness bravo history won't repeat itself what a relief you know it's going to be another act of our grand human drama of history but it is not the same story okay N never again a chance to win this time so i would say that's um, more or less how i see it and he is doing well in terms of speaking you know for his country the only problem that I'm having with this situation for Zelensky, uh, which is overwhelming, you know, Western media, is that he is kind of overshadowing the other heroes. As a, as a writer, I am a speaker for the civil society, not for the Ukrainian political class. And, uh, and yes, we do have heroes worth mythologizing. Yes, we do have perfect fantastic stories and yes we do have great commanders uh, who really win this war on the professional basis we have we have fantastic young generals you know this straight of these young generals in their late 40s early 50s you know this general that 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 were produced yes by 30 years of ukraine's independence a totally new type of warriors so to speak and i really have a problem you know with say uh, 
mm, well, like, like in Germany, there are six biographies of Zelensky that appeared last fall, and not a single biography of General Zeluzhny. That's somehow, well, a disbalance, you know, and uh, that creates, uh, again, you know, the wrong perspective of what's, what's on and what, what is going on down there. The important thing is that uh, what we've been discussing before, actually, is, is a kind of a collective will of a civil society something which Russia always misses in all its scenario plotted against Ukraine because there is no and has never been civil society in Russia. And uh, with this, um, you know, Ukrainian, Ukrainian civil society and its, its heroes, let's talk about Ukraine is this very multifarious, you know, and very colorful country full of stories to deliver. You said the, the clown that became a hero. Oksana, it sounds like you're writing his sort of Hollywood intro to the film already. Um, well, it is in a way. <laughs> we are all within a Hollywood uh, film in a way because that's what shapes, you know, our narration and our way of, fra of framing things. Aliona, would you like to add to that? I'd be cu particularly curious just to, just to first of all, hear what you have to say, but also your, your reaction as well as Oksana's to the sort of, as Oksana said, the infatuation from many in the West towards President Zelensky. I think the fact that we're being somewhat in a Hollywood movie right now and we're part of this pop culture is both a bit sad, but also it's our saving grace. In today's world, when the world is dominated by what's on the agenda, what's the number one headline of today, what's the most controversial, uh, the thing that produces most emotions, the thing that kind of strikes you and gets you out of your routine and the influx of information that people in the West are exposed to on a daily basis. If that is Ukraine and if that is achieved through Zelensky and his persona right now and his acting skills, which are certainly superb, his feel for communication, um, I think I can only thank him for that. And yes, similarly to Oksana, um, I didn't get to vote because I just moved to the UK, so I didn't get my documents straight first. But when he made his first announcement that he is going to be running for the president, I was highly skeptical. And that skepticism, of course, came from 13 years in Ukrainian politics and, and a great political science education that I've got from uh, my university back home and professors saying, one thing uh, that you know statesmen must uh, be produced by very diligent work and preparation you can't have singers and actors and showmen and sportsmen which was a very predominant and kind of normal thing for Ukrainian politics, the politics of a developing democracy after a totalitarian state where political pluralism was at its highest and anyone and everyone could go and start a political party. And I think we had a time when the number of political parties in Ukraine have reached like 200 or something. And we had a party of everyone from the beer lovers to the appreciation of women's society, etc. cetera. Um, it, ridiculous amount of you know outburst of that expression that wasn't always appropriate wasn't always necessary or effective to to take the country forward and so that's one thing that we've been taught that you do need to have professional people you do need lawyers economists political scientists analysts to form and create a successful country and ever since 2004 and that was when i started my political science degree after the orange revolution again with this attempt to overthrow and get rid of the old faces, the ones who were, you know, members of Communist Party back in Soviet Union, and then all of a sudden they're Social Democrats, or they're the Labour Party, or, uh, you know, Nationalist Party, or, or whatnot. We had so many of them come and go that you really wanted new faces, but those new faces usually came, and, and the, the parties also were quite smart with that when they've uh, chosen celebrities to represent those new faces. But eventually those celebrities, of course, having no expertise or really determination to do anything but essentially sell their face because it was only well known, they failed massively. So when I saw uh, the series that Zelensky produced, you know, where he becomes the president, that was the first kind of worry of mine. What What is he doing and why is he doing that? Um, and then if eventually when he announced, I was highly skeptical. 
that we have yet another performer trying to capitalize on his fame. But I think later, the more I heard him speak, I heard his strategy, his view for the country, it at least seemed sincere. And that's something that I think, again, coming from politics and just being a, a regular Ukrainian, looking at these politicians from that perspective every day, you really miss. Because everyone had an agenda, everyone had some sort of business ties, everyone was backed by one oligarch or another, and you finally had a hope that maybe we have someone who actually cares for people. After so many disappointments in Ukrainian politics, you're really looking for that sincere leader. And I think Zelensky has managed to be that. He, of course, was not great for the first year of his presidency. He made many mistakes. Again, not having the team was his number one impediment. He didn't have professionals around him, nor was he a professional himself. So that was somewhat failing. But I think in the time of war, being the crisis manager, and again, his number one role, especially according to the Constitution of Ukraine, because we're a parliamentary presidential republic, so his role as a president is to coordinate the defense sector and to represent Ukraine on the international stage. And I think he's done both brilliantly. Could we zoom out a little bit um, and go back to something Oksana and Francis talked about, which was, I think, the sort of the naivety of the Western approach in the 90s, in the 2000s and beyond. Um, of course, there were some nations that weren't particularly naive whatsoever, thinking about the Baltic states and Central Europe, Ukraine, Poland. Um, I wanted to ask you all to come in on this. How do you think, uh, well, can we talk to the, the shifts within the sort of post-Soviet bloc um, after, the, the, uh, after Ukrainian independence and the independence of all the other states that previously fell in, in the Soviet empire, if we can call it that? Um, Aliona or Francis, would you like to start on that? Well, I think, of course, one of the most interesting things for me of this war is the fact that for we like to think that politics is a rational process, that it's almost like a game of chess and that you could have, it doesn't matter which country, which politician is playing at the game, that they look at the same uh, pos geopolitical positioning and they would reach rationally, if they have all of the evidence in front of them, the same correct conclusion. But actually what's been so striking about the war in Ukraine, and you could argue that it was true in the 90s and that it's been true since the invasion uh, in February last year, is that every country has processed the war history uh, um, differently based on its history. Mm -hmm. uh, so Germany has looked at the war through its prism. Poland has looked at the war through its prism. Uh, Ukraine, of course, has. The Baltic states have. And so it just emphasizes this point that history is often, for all of our talk of it being a rational process and geopolitics being a rational process that's evidence driven, that it is defined still very, very strongly by these cultural propensities that are deep, deep, deep within uh, respective countries. And I think there are huge positives with that, which is that the, as you were talking about, the, 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 the history, the shared sufferance under the Soviet Union that was experienced by the Baltic states and uh, other post-Soviet states has meant that they have been for now signaling for years about the danger that Putin posed and that Russia posed. And I think back to when the, the intelligence briefings were prior to the invasion, it was only really the Baltic states, America and Britain that believed that this was going to happen. The others were more skeptical. And you would have guessed if you had a, if you'd guessed who would be skeptical about how to behave in this war, you probably would have had Germany and France at the top of the list of countries that would have been skeptical about, and, and, and so it has proved. And it is, as I say, a remarkable thing to me that for all of the conversations about thinking uh, about how to counteract the threat now and the mistakes that were made, we're still very much seeing this through our own nat national histories. And it does concern me because I think that trying to be an objective and of course one could say that I'm actually doing this just from a British perspective that we haven't been conquered for a thousand years so we're like very gung-ho about these things but um, I, I tend to think that you know the political there's the, the strategy of political ambiguity failed right it was the defining pillar of the post-Soviet era was this idea that we don't want to say where our red lines are as the West, the collective West, that it, it, it means that um, if, you, if you're politically ambiguous, you're strategically ambiguous, that that strengthens your hand because they don't, Russia or China don't dare uh, to uh, go, go beyond and, and to make, take risks. But actually, as we've seen with Ukraine, that it is an enabler as opposed to a deterrent. And what concerns me is because politics, to end my point, is not a rational process, the lesson is not being learned because it's so culturally ingrained. And it has implications now 
because it, it, it's having an impact on the decisions being made about the weapons to be sent. It's having uh, implications on the political discourses in the respective countries. And so it concerns me. And I think that the, the Soviet bloc or the post-Soviet bloc, should I say, have been right and should have been listened to much, much earlier. And of course, the 90s speaks to that. Oksana? I fully subscribed to everything uh, <laughs> what Francis said, except for one thing. Okay. If I may use, you know, this time that I still have left um, for just one humble request, please, please, please stop using the word post-Soviet with the regard to all these countries in the East, which you pack, you know, into this one basket 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Empire. You can't imagine how humiliating it is. In Germany a couple of months ago, when in Berlin I just lost my tempers, uh, Ukraine, comma, post-Soviet Republic, and I said, well, you know, guys, it's more or less like, I, like if I were saying Germany, former Third Reich. It is like refusing, you know, this newly independent country, which countries which you don't bother to, to learn uh, to pronounce properly, like refusing them their own political history, you know, and, uh, and it really sounds, well, kind of, well, annoying and humiliating, I have to say. We've got time if you want to go and wash your mouth out now, <laughs> Francis. <laughs> no, you can, you can, you I've, learned my, I've learned my lesson. I mean, <laughs> I just use it purely as a historical category, although I totally accept I your know. point, which is I that know. it can be used but in the wrong hands as a means of attacking the... It has been used. Yes. It has been used, yes. you know, and, uh, uh, and in, in the end, you mm. know, you were having, in the, through the first mm. weeks after Putin's invasion, uh, the Western press was still using the term Ukraine crisis. Like, I mean, that was really not just offending, but hair raising, like Ukraine crisis. Hey, it is not crisis. It is not Ukraine crisis. When you have a foreign army, a, a, a 200,000 foreign army on your territory, of course you are going to have crisis. Sooner or later, it will follow inevitably, you know, <laughs> the, when you have your infrastructure bomb bombarded and uh, bombed and, uh, you know, and economy, economy destroyed of, of course sooner or later you are going to have crisis but that's not how you describe this hey i mean well september 1939 was not polish crisis you know it was hitler's attack upon poland so uh, the question you know how the rise of the of a new hitler uh, in the northeast part of europe was totally overlooked I think, well, it's worth, you know, well, dissertations yet to be written, libraries of books yet to be written. Mm, well, but now at least we, we, what, what, what we can do is to follow our language. Alena, would you like to add to that? I think the language is indeed extremely important. And to uh, add to some misconceptions that were noted previously by, you know, mistakes that the West has made, um, towards Ukraine, th there have been words used like naivety and uh, ambiguity. I think all of that stems from uh, maybe not a very nice one that I will add, um, which is indifference and hence the inertia in the Western policies towards Ukraine. Because of the lack of knowledge of Ukraine, of Ukraine's history, just like Oksana just mentioned, we weren't just a Soviet Republic. That was only a, a brief period of history in our memories, in our national memory. Um, we really are a state and we have that national um, state mentality um, that spans centuries. And the same thing can be said about Crimea, for example. You know, now everyone is talking that Crimea is Russia's red line. Do people even comprehend that Crimea was given off by Stalin to Ukraine mid 20th century as a burden he, that he didn't want to deal with, didn't want to invest in? It didn't have any fresh running water. It was completely undeveloped. It was not, you know, the pearl of tourism as it is now of Ukraine, um, now annexed by Russia. It was really an empty, dry land that had no use and. Um, 
s Russian Soviet res Republic decided to get rid of it because it was burdening its its budget. And to say more than that, Crimea was only part of Russian vicinity in various um, states uh, for six percent of its history. Apart from that, there are indigenous people, Tatars, who actually are you know the native people on the land. And Ukraine was the one who was protecting the rights of those indigenous people to the fullest. But to go back to your question, I think it's because exactly that, that all of the states surrounding Russia that were part of Soviet Union, that were perhaps previously partially part of Russian empire, they were all kind of automatically considered to become a sphere of Russia's influence. You know, the West was really good at getting rid of their own empires, France and eventually uh, England, the United Kingdom. You've all decided to take this step forward in history and appreciate that that time is in the past and you've changed the narrative um, accordingly, whereas Russia has never made that transition. The Soviet Union as an empire fell apart but Russia never changed its, its mentality as a center of an empire. It's never changed its mentality towards the state surrounding it, that those are nothing but, you know, feudal vassals or, or whatever they want to call it. So, and I think sadly, by propaganda, by historical treatment, by repressions and killings and famines and everything that we went through, not just in Ukraine, in countries like Kazakhstan and, and then Georgia who suffered in Uzbekistan. We've seen the, the Soviet terror. Many of the people got silenced. Many got turned into slaves just like Russians because that is the mechanism that sadly the Russian state is very effectively applying to all the people to undermine them and put them exactly where they want them. But I, th I feel like that is also changing. It started with Ukraine, and just to, again, echo President Zelensky in his inaugural speech, with, which I thought was very groundbreaking, maybe he didn't even realize to, to what point that will change, because obviously he couldn't predict that the war was coming and what kind of leader he was going to be. He mentioned it in a capacity that he was going to be the young leader, not from the Soviet system, leading Ukraine towards European future. He is doing just that, but under you know the circumstances of the war, and now changing the whole perception of Eurasia, of our region, of all the countries in Soviet space. And he he told the people in those countries, look towards Ukraine because we are now going the path, going down the path that you will all go down soon as well. And the more I speak to representatives of those countries, of Central Asia, of Caucasus. Um, Georgia as well, who sadly has been invaded since 2008 and now has almost kind of given up their political fight for their country, sadly, although I do think it's temporarily. And as we see the successes in Ukraine come in, we will see the change in, in the region even more. But all those countries and people there are starting to raise their heads. And it's, it's been fascinating to watch that change throughout the year, speaking to people from all of these countries when at first it was just a sense of fear and, um, you know, feeling bad for Ukrainians and compassion. And sadly, you have to go through this. You might cease to exist to then, wow, you're actually stronger than we thought. Well done. To now, people are saying, you know, we're counting on you. We're just waiting for you to make that shift, to make that click and, you know, defeat Russia. And we will be the next to go. We're really counting on you. Thank you, um, all of you, for your answers there. Can we go to some um, listener questions that have been sent in? Um, first is on a topic, really, that um, we haven't discussed so far in the conversation, but what has the, what has the impact of this invasion been on Russia? Francis, do you want to take that? Yes, well, I think you have to look at this in... in it, it's a, I always think back of the Churchill quote, was it, that Russia is a... I'm going to butcher this. It's a, 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 riddle, a riddle lapped in an enigma inside it or something. Anyway, you, you get the essence of it, that it's a confusing place. And I feel like that on this question of what the impact of the war has been, actually. Because if one is looking at it in a positive way, then you would say, well, uh, the, the sanctions have had an impact. You look at the... Uh, the Yale paper, which has been cited now many times, talking about the long-term implications on the Russian economy. I think it's going to sh have shrunk by 10% this year. At some point, that's going to have a major, major impact on 
the country and its attitude to this war, I think. As well, the losses that Russia has suffered. It, 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 it cannot keep sustaining these kind of losses without it having an impact in, in some area. I mean, it couldn't last eight years in Afghanistan, for instance, before, you know, it, and that was only 50,000 soldiers lost, and, but it did last a long time. So uh, there is signs, I think, that there, this is having an impact. And yet on the more negative side, I think the sanctions have not had the impact that people thought initially. Putin clearly had planned that if this were to happen and the West were to cut Russia off, that actually he made his economy robust enough as an exporter that it would be able to still financially be viable. And not only that, he also unfortunately relied on the fact that the West would still need to buy its energy, which of course it has done. It is still continuing, despite the sanctions, to be to be buying that. So there are the signs of optimism in terms of the impact that this will have on Russia, but there are also signs of, of pessimism but I think the broadest question that the West now has to be asking, which is how does one change a fascistic regime, which is the one that we are seeing in Russia, without what is usually the answer, military occupation? Historically, the only ways in which the cultures have been fundamentally changed is to be militarily humbled. Uh, if you're looking at the, again, I keep using the, this example today, I don't quite know why, maybe it's because of Biden's visit to Kiev. Um, the Confederacy is humbled in the American Civil War. Of course, Nazi Germany is humbled, its culture changes. Japan is occupied, its culture changes. That is not an option in the case of Russia. Kiev is, uh, President Zelensky is not going to march on Moscow. So we have to be asking a very complicated, nuanced question now, which is how to facilitate that change when the normal conventional modes of changing a culture are off the table. That has to be, I think, prolonged sanctions. It has to be political isolation. It has to be a long-term strategy. And it has to be the bleeding of information and culture with a different outlook into the country. But unfortunately, I don't think we've been seeing that unity of purpose in the West and a really coherent articulation of what that strategy is. Thank you, Francis. Let's just get to some more of these questions. Uh, Dom Nichols, why has this been a ground war and not an air war? <laughs> I mean, that, that is a very good question. We think it's because... Russia has failed to knock out the Ukrainian Air Force in the first few days of the war. And, and then, as I said at the start, there were five different big military activities happening. And the Air Force was just working in isolation. So when it became apparent that the Ukrainian Air Force still existed and therefore Russia did not own the skies and could do whatever it likes on the ground, roughly, if you own the skies, um, there wasn't enough weight behind the the Air Force, if you like, to say, hang on, we, we still need to deal with this before we can move on to the next thing. So because they didn't have air superiority, i.e. They, they could own that, that little bit of bit of sky so they can do what they like on the ground, um, Russia has been very reluctant to send its, its fighters forward of their own troops. And therefore, if they're not going to go forward and extend this sort of safety umbrella, the ground forces haven't been able to do um, much at all. So why have we not seen the Air Force? Possibly because they're preserving stocks as they, as they, um, as they now realise it's a very non-permissive environment as, they, as the, the flow of air defence missiles has, has gone into the country. Russia now realises actually it, it is a much tougher fight now than it was a year ago. They're even more reluctant to, to expose their um, airframes to, uh, to danger and therefore even more likely to have to rely on, as we've seen in the last few months, just periodic bombardments from the air launched from hundreds of miles away in some cases. Thanks, I like how this, we've got a military question, right, Dom, you can take this. <laughs> um, Aliona, one question to you, then one question to Oksana, then I think we should finish. Um, Aliona, you, you, you talked a little bit, little bit about this before, about some of the mistakes and assumptions made by the Western commentariat and the Western media. What aspect of, this is from a listener, what aspect of the conventional wisdom on Ukraine do you think will be proven wrong next? I think, first of all, just to echo very briefly what Francis said about sanctions, because that has been a very Im important mistake that was made by the West. And perhaps this is why Russia is not doing as badly as we'd expect it to be doing now, is because, A, the sanctions were implemented way too late. I remember that even at this time last year ago, late January, I suppose, and at, there was a discussion at Chatham House, a very big round table, talking about, OK, if invasion happens, what sanctions should be imposed on Russia? It was that level of narrative. And I remember experts and all policymakers agreeing solidly on the fact that, you know, cancelling SWIFT for Russia is an absolutely nuclear option. And I remember this quote and I was thinking to myself, 
we are talking about full-scale invasion of a country that's been at war for eight years. What kind of nuclear option of cancelling SWIFT are we talking about now? And, you know, it was three months, I think, after the invasion or uh, two two months or, or so not. A very brief period of time, to be honest, where they did cancel SWIFT, ban SWIFT for, for some Russian banks, even though other ones are still operating on it. We are seeing that, you know, sanctions that the European Union is coming up with, they are effective, but only to an extent, because first of all, the important factor in that is, as Oksana said, Putin is not very good at war, but he's very good at professional lying, uh, misconceiving people and, you know, leading them apart. Divide and conquer is if the everlasting narrative of, of Russia, and that's how it's strived to be successful. It knew the weaknesses of European and Western generally governments and individuals very well. And it knew that not to make any certain decisions, the effective decisions happen. They just knew what you know buttons to push and who to drive apart and how not to make certain decisions happen. And in even the price cap on oil. Um, the price cap is a good decision, but then it should be around $35 per barrel if we want to see the real change for Russia, because last year proved to be the, the year when Russia was rigging the most oil in its history. Some other th sanctions that Russia is willing and able to circumvent is, you know, the supply chain, their number one replacement of semiconductor elements and, and everything that fires their attack comes from China, of course, Pakistan, Iran, and all the other wonderful states of, of this world. So the world really needs, again, going back to the question of ambiguity, set what the time, what's the frame of this war is? What's the policy framing? What are the actions? How far does the West want to go? And this perfectly ties into the, the listener's question of what is the main misconception that, that the world misread about Ukraine? I think the importance of Ukraine is number one factor. Again, it's not just a post-Soviet state somewhere, um, you know, a little country far away no one knows much about. That was the mistake of Second World War, and we're learning our lessons that we failed to learn before. Ukraine is key to peace and success in Europe. When I was even growing up at school and then studying political science, they kept saying to us that, you know, we are technically, unfortunately, or luckily, a buffer state. We're between the East and the West. We are on that line of civilizational clash. And wherever Ukraine decides to go, and we have seen it this year, wherever Ukraine decides to go, the world will go. If we decide to go into back into the Russian orbit of, s of influence, support authoritarianism in the world, contribute with all of our enormous wealth, the people, the intellect and everything else. All the other, you know, former Soviet republics, all the countries in the vicinity, they will follow and the world will suffer from it. Ukraine has decided differently. We paid our lives for it. Back at the revolution, you know, on the streets of a peaceful European capital, and we're paying for that every day. Wherever, if Ukraine decided to go west and support the Western values and sacrifice our lives for these Western values, maybe it's time for the West to remember what those values are and actually stand up for them. Oksana, Francis, Dom and Elena, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for answering the listeners' questions uh, and thank you for, for a very fruitful discussion. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. We broadcast live on Twitter at 1 o'clock GMT and the podcast comes out on all of your favourite podcast apps later in the day. If you enjoyed this special podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app, and if you have a moment, leave a review. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. And you can also contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear. Thank you for watching.